Welcome everyone to our next Hear You webinar today on genetics, unraveling the significance of genetics on protein spilling diseases. My name is Kristen Hood, NEFCARE's Director of Clinical Outreach, and I will be your moderator today for this webinar. We have an amazing physician here today from Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School to speak to you today on the elements of gene, the genome and genetics and how it all relates to kidney disease. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to ask um, and let you know that you have been muted and you will remain muted for the entirety of this webinar. We will offer a short Q&A at the end of the educational session. I'm going to encourage you throughout the webinar to go ahead and enter your question in the Q&A section if you hover around at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Go ahead and enter questions as we go along. We will answer as many as possible at the end. Um, I do apologize in advance if we don't get to your question, uh, but I do need to be respectful of Dr. Sampson and the patients that he needs to get back to seeing today. So finally, this webinar is going to be recorded. It's recording now um, and will be posted to NEFCARE's website um, under, as a patient resource under educational programs. So you can look for that uh, very soon on our website. I'd also like to recognize our NEFCARE sponsors that help make programs like this available to you, which is Retrofin, the Pfizer Foundation, Chinook Therapeutics, and Goldfinch Bio. So thank you so much for our sponsors. And so now it's my privilege to introduce to you Matt Sampson. Dr. Sampson is an attending physician and nephrologist at Boston Children's Hospital, is also an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and proclaims on Twitter to be obsessed with using genomics to discover causes and cures for kidney disease. Dr. Sampson is a longtime friend of NEFCARE and is listed as one of our amazing NEFCARE specialists on kidneyhealthgateway.com. We indeed love to use him and reach into and get more knowledge from him anytime we can. So thank you. We're super excited to have you here and welcome you today. Dr. Sampson, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, you are correct that I'm totally obsessed with trying to use genomics to find treatments and cures for kidney disease. And as a clinician and a scientist, it's the uh, interactions with patients, parents, families, and the kids I see that really motivate me to engage with my, all of my head and my heart onto this. So before I start, can someone just confirm that the slides look okay and I don't need to swap displays? Looks great. Thank you. Okay, cool. So here's all my information. This is our website and this is my, my Twitter handle. You guys can feel free to live tweet or share any of this that you'd like. So I want to really give an overview about the role of genetics in uh, protein spilling diseases and specifically nephrotic syndrome. And I want to start to make, by making sure that we're all on sort of the same page about what, uh, what genetics are. Okay. So our, our genes um, are, are the the code that, um, um, that makes the proteins that are in our cells that help us live and are really responsible for life. Our genetic code can really be thought of as a book that has a specific alphabet. And you can see this genetic code here in this, in this uh, figure as a series of letters of T's and A's and C's and G's. So really just four letters make up the human genome. And our human genome is made up of three billion of these letters. And out of those 3 billion letters, there are 20,000 groups of letters that come together to make a protein. And those 20,000 groups of letters are called genes. And those genes read just like a book or a recipe and they, there's a certain grammar and punctuation and spelling. And the genes, uh, the letters and the variant genes are laid out in, in an, an order like this. And it's a precise spelling and grammar. Now, Genes, the study of genes is called genetics. And it, with genetics, we recognize that sometimes there are changes in the letters of this alphabet. And it changes, like here, where we see in an original genetic sequence, a T, there's a single change where that T goes to a C. And that's like a typo. And just like certain typos you have in a book, you can have a typo and still read the page or the paragraph. And that would be a, a genetic change that's not very harmful. Sometimes there can be a, a change in a book or a recipe that's so significant that you can't finish the book or understand the meaning or make, or make the, the dinner that you're trying to make. 
And that would be like a disease causing mutation. So what we know is that these changes in genes are known as variants. So when, and we know that these genetic changes or variants can cause kidney disease. So we have a sad kidney here. This is for any kids who are on the call or any kid like adults like me. But we also know that genetic changes or mutations can cause a kidney disease. And we know that there's some, we can get some help in knowing if our cells or our child has a genetic change, okay? So that's the background. So we're gonna talk about this. And I'm obsessed with trying to find across the entire human genome, genetic changes that either cause kidney disease or contribute to it. So the outline here is I wanna give a bit of a basics of nephrotic syndrome genetics. I wanna to talk to you guys about the benefits of understanding the genetic drivers of nephrotic syndrome. By drivers, I mean that they either drive or completely cause the disease or they contribute to increased risk of disease. And really some practical questions that a lot of parents and people around the country and world who I interact with, they say, you know, what are the chances that my child or, I'm a pediatric nephrologist, so what are the chances that my child has a genetic form of nephrotic syndrome? How does understanding the genetics of a child or an adult with a genetic form of disease, how does it allow us to give better clinical advice? And then how does this understanding of genetics help us to ultimately try to develop treatments and cures that are specific to a patient's genetic signature? And finally, I wanna finish up with a research update on nephrotic syndrome genetics. I also wanna apologize if there's any background noise. I'm, I live above a busy street here right outside of Austin and uh, it, it, it's lunchtime, so people are all over the place. So I wanna start with the story of Jermaine. Uh, Jermaine and his mother, uh, Melissa, have given me permission to share this picture. And Jermaine came to me in 2009 and he had uh, the features and the puffiness around his eyes and his face and his belly was all swollen. And, um, he clearly had nephrotic syndrome and I was just a brand new, a brand new nephrologist and even I knew that it was nephrotic syndrome. But uh, Jermaine's mom asked some very important questions that I didn't have great answers to. She said, you know, Dr. Sampson, why does Jermaine have nephrotic syndrome? And I said, you know, I don't really know. And then she said, what's going to happen? And I said, well, I don't know. Um, well, I didn't say it like that. I was very respectful. I said, I don't know. Um, we're going to give some medications, and if he responds to the medications, then he'll have one form of nephrotic syndrome. If he doesn't, he'll have a resistant form of nephrotic syndrome. And then she said, can you help him? And what I knew is that we could help him with like um, lots of different immunotherapies. We could try, we, but there's no guarantee that it, would, that it would help or not. And I became convinced that um, getting after the genetic aspects of this would, um, would help me answer these questions better, because I got really frustrated not being able to give great answers. So we know that nephrotic syndrome is a disease of the kidney and within the kidney in this light pink area called the cortex, there's about a million, million filtering units or glomeruli. And the glomeruli are like spaghetti strainers for your blood. So uh, healthy blood and proteins and waste and extra fluid comes into the glomeruli and it goes through these tubes and the good stuff stays in and goes back to the body like blood and protein. And the bad stuff like waste and acid and extra fluid goes out into the urine. And nephrotic syndrome, things like minimal change disease, FSGS, uh, membranous nephropathy, comes from an injury or damage to this glomerular filtration barrier, where rather than being intact and keeping the good stuff in and letting the bad stuff out, everything, all the proteins leave the blood. The blood the, all the proteins leave the blood through the kidney into the urine. So this is just a picture of what we are studying. So this is a picture of the glomerulus and sitting on top of the glomerulus is the podocyte and the podocyte acts by extending these, these processes and these fingers and it, they fold in with other processes and fingers and foot processes from other podocytes and they, they wrap around the blood vessel and they form a barrier to prevent protein from leaving. And then for children and adults with nephrotic syndrome, those podocytes get messed up and you could see that it, they lose their shape, they lose their overlapping, and it looks sort of like a little bomb went off in the glomerulus. And that's what nephrotic syndrome is. And it's our job to figure out why this happens. And it's our job to use the medications we have right this second to change this look back in this look and to put someone in remission. And the real issue with nephrotic syndrome right now, when we classify it, it's pretty imprecise. So we're not very specific. So it's sort of lame that our, you know, a patient shows up with nephrotic syndrome, 
and we give them steroids. And then if they're sensitive, we say your disease's name is steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. Or if they're resistant, we say your drug disease is called steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Or if we do a, a biopsy, we say, and on the biopsy, we see minimal changes. And this is a picture of a kidney biopsy. We say, you have minimal changes on biopsy, so you have minimal change disease. Or if we see focal areas of segmental sclerosis, we say, you have FSGS. But there's so many different flavors and classifications within these. And they don't really give us any, these names and classifications don't give us any indication of why it's happening. It would be like, you know, oftentimes when I talk to my patients and, you know, these days in terms of cancer, you know, we don't just say to uh, a person that you have lump in the breast syndrome. Although if you did a biopsy of someone with breast cancer, you'd say that's a lump in the breast. But we say, no, you have breast cancer due to this mutation and this change, and this is the drug that works for you, or these are the outcomes. Um, and that, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more precise. So I don't have to tell Jermaine or his mom that you just have, she just had, he just has steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. We get to say more about it. And we know that the nephrotic syndrome, you know, has the variable outcomes and there's steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome, then there's steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome or frequently relapsing. Some children and adults progress to chronic kidney disease. Some patients can get a kid uh, or end stage and some children who get a transplant or adults, then they get a recurrence of their uh, FSGS in their transplant that really stinks. And the morbidity and the mortality of the illness that comes with nephrotic syndrome is both from the nephrotic syndrome itself, but also the treatment of the condition. And this is germane over the years. Uh, he got very sick in 2010 and then he was in remission in 2016. But then back in, in 2018, and even now, right now, he's dealing with a relapse and they're trying all sorts of medications for him. So this kind of stinks. And I think this might be the story that many of you all have experienced. And what I'm convinced of and what my colleagues are convinced of, because you know, I'm the one here right now, but I'm representing a huge community around the world of kidneyomics or kidney genomics people. So you guys should feel really excited that there's a ton of folks going after this. What we really believe is that we can find a patient, in a patient who shows up with nephrotic syndrome, we can find a genetic signature when they first show up that can give us an indication of which of these courses they're gonna find, that could give us an indication if they're gonna have recurrence or not. And which will also give us not an just an indication to give better advice, but an indication of what kind of drugs or therapies can be designed to, to uh, specifically treat the patient without side effects. This is our aspiration and our goal. We've seen some indications of this being successful already, especially, especially with regards to advice. But I think in the, as we're working really hard and over the next five, 10, 15 years, I think we're gonna get more and more ability to inter, interweave genetic signatures with clinical actionability. So here's my view. So how can genomic discovery be helpful? So whether, you know, when maybe some of you have had genetic testing for your kid or yourself and the doctor is doing genetic testing, you know, I think it's based on these really three fundamentals. You know, sometimes if we can make a genetic discovery, it could help us determine treatment, some medications to take or avoid. And I'll talk more about details later. Genomic discovery, if we figure out a, your, your child has or has not a genetic signature, can determine screening other parts of the body because some forms of nephrotic syndrome don't just affect the kidneys, they can affect the ears or hearing or vision or bones. So if we know that they have a certain genetic signature, we could look for other parts of the body that haven't been caught yet, but maybe pick up something earlier. And finally, I think in, in nephrology and nephrotic syndrome with kidney transplant, knowing someone's genetic signature can be very informative in choosing who can give a, a kidney and outcomes when receiving a kidney. Okay. And again, just like Kristen said, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll do some Q&A later. I'd be happy to get involved with that. So I just talked about the basics. Of, so let me talk to you now about the basics of nephrotic syndrome genetics, all right? So what I would say is that there are three known categories of genetic forms of nephrotic syndrome. The three main categories, and I'll get into details later, are Mendelian or monogenic nephrotic syndrome, APOL1 associated nephrotic syndrome, or HLA associated nephrotic syndrome, or immune type of nephrotic syndrome. Now, the, the vast history of nephrotic syndrome genetics and all the genetic testing that's being done clinically these days is in the world of Mendelian and monogenic nephrotic syndrome. So we'll talk much more about that. But we should also know that uh, these are increasing in importance. So what, what is Mendelian nephrotic syndrome? So Mendelian nephrotic syndrome means that there are genetic changes in about 60 genes. So remember, we have about 20,000 genes in our genome. 
And about 60 of them, if you put a typo into that gene that's bad enough, it's sufficient to cause nephrotic syndrome. And what we know about these Mendelian genes and monogenic, so it's Latin mono, meaning one genic gene, so one gene, that if you break one of these genes, and most of these genes are located in that favorite cell of mine that I was telling you about, the podocyte, which wraps around the glomerulus to aid in filtering. So we've learned the podocyte is the major cell that's involved in nephrotic syndrome by not f figuring out that there are these 60 Mendelian genes, okay? So that's a Mendelian form of nephrotic syndrome. So some of the questions sometimes are, uh, are asked is, you know, how should I suspect that my child might have a monogenic form of disease or Mendelian nephrotic syndrome? So here's a cartoon that are showing four different things that may make you think that your child has a grip or your, you see, I'm a pediatrician. There's probably a lot of adults with this condition on here and I totally apologize. I think you guys are really important. I do research on adults, but I keep saying your child. So I hopefully you'll forgive me. And I'm glad I guess I don't see your faces shaking your head saying, you know, Dr. Sampson, come on, what about me? So anyway, so there are, there are four different characteristics. One is if, if the person with nephrotic syndrome has a family history of the disease. So this shows a family tree and in black are people with the disease. So this is a grandmother, two of her children, and one of her children has three of their four kids has disease. Um, earlier onset of disease. So the younger a child is or a person is having nephrotic syndrome, the more likely they have a monogenic form of disease. The more extreme their phenotype is. So this shows like a phenotype is like a clinical condition. This is a bell curve showing out of 100 people, only two or three people have this trait down here, or two or three people have this trait down here. So we can think about this as age. The people who are the youngest or the oldest or have the the, um, you know, the most severe disease are more likely to have a genetic form. And then if someone has nephrotic syndrome, they also have problems maybe with their eyes or their ears or their heart or their lungs, they're more likely to have a Mendelian or monogenic form of disease. So family history, early onset, things besides the kidney that are uh, uh, a problem. Those are sus suspected places for uh, Mendelian disease. Okay, so that's classification, one of the genetic form of nephrotic syndrome. The second form of genetic nephrotic syndrome is APOL1-associated kidney disease. And APOL1 stands for apolipoprotein L1. So APOL1 is a gene, and there are variants, so there are typos in the APOL1 gene that are very common in uh, Black Americans, and actually people across the world who have African ancestry. And these genetic variants cause a greatly increased risk of kidney disease in these individuals. And oftentimes, if a genetic change is really bad, oftentimes it just goes away and doesn't get passed on to the next generation. But the APOL1 variants are common because everyone in their genome, for each uh, letter of that alphabet, you have two copies, okay? So, um, so um, an individual here, so that, or an allele. So someone who has none of these APOL1 copies, they, they, about 8,000 years ago in West Africa, were dying of a uh, parasite disease called sleeping sickness. So then they had zero copies. And then individuals had a, this uh, spontaneous genetic change where they developed uh, these APOL1 variants. So that having one APOL1 variant was able to kill off the parasites. So all of a sudden, all these people from West Africa with a single risk allele were not dying anymore of having from uh, parasitic infection, then we're passing on their genes. But then when those individuals with one risk allele then develop, carry two risk alleles in APOL1, that's when they develop kidney disease. So it's APOL1 is a form of kidney disease of nephrotic syndrome that is quite common in uh, black individuals. And the third form of kidney disease that I'm not really gonna talk too much about here today from the genetic perspective is this HLA or immune complex disease. HLA is just an abbreviation for the part of the gene, the genetics uh, or the genome that is responsible for fighting infection. And whereas this is the frequency of a mutation or of genetic change in the population. So this is a graph. So this is genetic changes that are very rare in the population. These are genetic changes that are more common in the population. And effect size means if you have this genetic change, how big an impact does it have on causing disease? 
So the effect size is really big for this Mendelian disease, meaning that if you have a Mendelian genetic variant, it's very rare, but when you have the change, you get the disease. APOL1 is a very common genetic change with a big effect. And HLA immune is a more common allele, but if you have it, you don't necessarily get the disease, but you have an increased risk of disease if other things happen to you. So most patients with what well, we've, we've done research on with HLA disease have steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome. Patients have a strong immune component. They might have family members who have uh, nephrotic syndrome or diabetes, type one diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and there's an immune dysregulation, but it's much more complex and it's not really ready for clinical testing yet. But we know that a lot of, I bet a lot of you will talk to me, would talk to me if we had a big conversation about your child having, or you having immune dysregulation or infections or a relapse comes after an infection. And this is, I think has to do with this HLA classification. But my lab is working on a lot of research that we need to figure out this a bit more. Okay. So those are the flavors. Now, what about the chances? So you might want to know, okay, what are the chances that my kid has this genetic form of nephrotic syndrome? Okay. So now we'll start with the Mendelian or monogenic disease. So how many kids with nephrotic syndrome have a Mendelian or monogenic disease? So this is the percent chances that a child who has steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome has a genetic uh, Mendelian form of their disease. So, um, in the United States, there's a study in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in Los Angeles, California, and then in Boston, and then another one in the United States. And it says, what we all found is that there's probably between about a 6 and a 15% chance that a child with steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome has a Mendelian form of disease. The chances that a child with steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome has a Mendelian form of disease is essentially zero at this point in time. So if you have steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome in the US, you might have about a five to 10% chance. I think these numbers are a little more, you know, 10%, let's just say 10% chance. If you have steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome, you essentially have a 0% chance of having Mendelian disease. For colleagues and children, adults in, in, in England and uh, Europe, China, Chile, there's a di different percentages. And I should mention that this is a kid, this is a number from kids, okay? So this is very important. So for adults, these numbers are much lower. It's probably about a 3% a chance of, of having Mendelian disease if you have steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome. How about APOL1-associated kidney disease? So what this is showing here is a, a theoretic, an imaginary population of Black and Americans with FSGS, whether adults or kids, who come to our kidney clinic to see their nephrologist because they're they have FSGS. So if they're Black Americans with FSGS or another form of nephrotic syndrome, there's about a 70% chance, all in pink, all these individuals would have a high-risk APO1 genotype. So that means that there's a large proportion of Black individuals with FSGS who have a genetic form of their disease coming from APO1. It's important to recognize, though, that not everyone who has the APO1 genetic change has the kidney disease. 13% of all Black Americans have the high-risk APOL1 change, but each one of those individuals only has about a 4% lifetime risk of developing FSGS. But from our perspective, you guys are all patients or family members of patients. The number of 70%, if you show up and have it, is, 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 a, is a good number to remember. Okay, so if we diagnose a child or an adult with Mendelian or monogenic nephrotic syndrome, or um, APOL1 associated kidney disease, how might that impact our ability to give advice or treatment recommendations? So here's some clinical insights from genomic testing, all right? So if we, um, if we I, uh, uh, you know, genetic testing might help us know when to start or stop a specific therapy. So for instance, if a child has a Mendelian or monogenic form of FSGS, we know that we can advise a family or a doctor to stop giving steroids because patients with Mendelian nephrotic syndrome do not respond to steroids. Furthermore, sometimes patients with um, nephrotic syndrome have a gen Mendelian genetic change, which lets us know that they never will respond. Well, that's basically the same thing. I have the Alport thing here, but I'll talk to you 
about that elsewhere. I guess it, it's a diagnostic change because some patients who have this condition called Alport syndrome, initially they might just be diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome because we just use this imprecise clinical and biopsy thing. But if we do a genetic test and we find out that they have Alport syndrome, that changes the way we think about the patient in terms of our management and advice. And going right into that, if we find a, a, a genetic form of disease, like a Mendelian form of disease, it could dictate our screening outside of the kidney. So let's go to Alport again, okay? So let's say your child has steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, or you have it. The doctor does a genetic test, and they find out, oh my gosh, you have the genetic change in a gene that causes Alport syndrome. Well, we know Alport syndrome can cause some vision problems, can also cause some hearing difficulties in the patient and also maybe in family members. So we would send that person to get their eyes and ears tested. Or sometimes we hear things like, oh man, like, you know, my child's always had a bit of a hearing difficulty, but we thought it was really uh, uh, nothing. Or they had like poor learning in school and they didn't realize it was a hearing problem. A patient with congenital nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome when they're just born, who has a genetic change at WT1, a Mendelian mutation, depending on that Mendelian mutation, we might screen them over time for the development of certain kidney cancers. And I think finally, it's in, uh, you know, genetic testing can help us think about kidney donation or receipt of a kidney. So what we know is that a patient who has Mendelian nephrotic syndrome or APOL1-associated nephrotic syndrome who gets a kidney transplant, they are not likely to have a recurrence of their disease. Occur is the wrong word for it. Sorry about that. It's recur. So if, you can, if a patient has a kidney transplant for a monogenic form of disease, you can feel pretty comfortable saying, if we put a new kidney in, you're not gonna have a recurrence. Whereas if they don't have a monogenic form of disease, we're more worried about it recurrence and we'll do things differently clinically. The APOL1 FSGS, even though the patient still has APOL1 change in their body, if you put in a new kidney that doesn't have the APOL1 change, it's not likely to have problems. If we know a patient's genetic signature, we can also be smarter about picking who to, uh, uh, give a kidney, uh, who, who can be a kidney donor. So for instance, if there's a 50 year old uh, woman who goes to end stage kidney disease and needs a kidney transplant and her 21 year old daughter really wants to give her the, uh, a kidney. If we know the patient's genetic, the mother's genetic uh, signature and she has a Mendelian form of disease, we would probably screen or think about screening the family members because for pre-symptomatic, so maybe that 21 year old doesn't yet have the disease, but they have the genetic change. We won't want to take out half the person's kidney mass um, if they're at risk of developing the disease. And, and this is a bigger deal in APOL1, which is more common in the black population with family members. So there's ongoing research in a study called the Apollo study and others to try to understand the risks of kidney donation for family members with APOL1 kidney disease. Okay. So I told you about the Steroid, Men Mendelian nephrotic syndrome is associated with steroid resistance, really an inability to respond to most immunotherapy. There's some evidence that there's some response to uh, things like tacrolimus and cyclosporin, but in general, they're resistant to disease. But if they get a kidney transplant, they're not more likely to recur. They're less likely to recur. Now with APOL1 disease, this is a study that we did in um, children, and this was replicated in another pediatric study. And we look, when we look at, um, it's actually adults too. When you look at black patients, we took a whole group of patients with nephrotic syndrome who were self-reported uh, as black, and I apologize for not capitalizing the B here, that's a typo. If you compare those to the low-risk genotype with the high-risk genotype, the black patients with April, uh, nephrotic syndrome in the high-risk genotype have a lower EGFR presentation, their EGFR declines faster over time, their biopsies show more evidence of damage, and they only have about a third of a chance of achieving complete remission. And finally, they also have about a five to 10 times increased odds of being born prematurely. So we think that there's some combination of prematurity, this APOL1 risk allele, and, and uh, nephrotic syndrome that we're still actively doing research in my lab, at, uh, the kidney omics lab, Samson lab type of work. Um, so what this is saying is that among FSGS patients, if you have high risk, if you have APOL1 form of FSGS, it's a more aggressive disease. And it means that we really, really need to work on finding treatments and cures for this because we have the opportunity to help a lot of individuals who are having a more significantly 
difficult experience. And that's an ongoing work from my lab as well as many other people in the world of uh, nephrotic syndrome. So let's talk now about, uh, we probably have about five minutes left and I want to give lots of time for questions. Um, we want to talk about like, with, you know, like I said, like the, my, our aspiration and goal that we're stealing ideas from cancer and heart disease and others is like, you know, if we can figure out the genetic signature, can we make drugs that are specific to it? So let me tell you a little bit about the ideas on how we might be able to do targeted therapies and better drug trials if we understand genetics. And this gets away from immediate clinical care right this second and gets the idea of the importance of enrolling yourselves or your children in uh, genetic research studies for kidney disease so we can try to work on these things. So this is like the, um, this is like the ideal dream story. This was published by our colleagues um, at uh, the University of Washington. And this was a child, a little baby, again, they was shared with permission. Uh, this was a little baby who was born and about nine months old developed a nephrotic syndrome and FSGS on biopsy. And the physicians, Dr. Starr and Dr. Hingarani, they did uh, uh, genetic testing and they found that this little boy had a mutation in this gene called CoQ2. Okay, so CoQ2 stands for coenzyme Q. And that's in a pathway in the, gene, in, the, in the cells that deal with energetics and energy and uh, coenzyme Q metabolism. And the, the Dr. Friedman Hildebrand, who's now my boss in, in, at Harvard, and who's done a lot of this genetic work too, everyone realizes that coenzyme Q is also available as a supplement that uh, people use as an over-the-counter thing. So these doctors said, well, if this, if this person, if this little boy's CoQ2 is broken, well, maybe giving uh, over-the-counter CoQ to them will help uh, them with their disease. And in fact, in this story, after the doctors there started CoQ10, this is time and this is urine protein to creatinine ratio. You can see that over time, the patient's proteinuria went away and they achieved complete remission. That child is doing well now. So this is just a case study. The next thing that would really be needed to be done would be like a clinical trial. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, doing a clinical trial would allow us to really understand whether CoQ10 is an effective therapy for patients with CoQ10 mutations, which again is probably only about a couple percent of the population. But if we could, you know, it might help like, you know, uh, one out of 100 kids or one out of 500 kids who have a CoQ mutation. But if we could just go down the line and figure out every gene and a, a treatment for every genetic change, or maybe a treatment that helps five or six of these genetic changes, we'd be more precise, we'd be more targeted with our therapy. Um, at the same time, oh yeah, I just wanna show, of course, this is him who's stable in remission. So we gotta see a picture of the happy kid. This is another, um, this is another thing that we're doing in APOL1 associated kidney disease. So this is a graph that we did and we published where every dot here is a gene. And what we were trying to do is figure out which genes are different in patients with high risk APOL1 and FSGS patients with low risk APOL1. And this on the x-axis is how much the gene changed in between high risk and low risk. And this is how significant or how much big of a deal that change is. And what we found out of these genes is three specific genes that seem to be much more active in high-risk APOL1 kidneys with FSGS than low-risk. So in our minds, these genes and the ongoing work we're doing in the Samson lab and other labs across the country, we're finding these genes and we're trying to evaluate whether these are targets for medications that could help cure or treat APOL1 forms of disease. So how would this work? So how would drug trials or clinical trials work with a genetic uh, flavor on them. And again, the fraud syndrome is a rare disease, and we need to try to make sure that we enroll as many children and adults in the fraud syndrome into drug studies as possible. Um, of course, I'm not saying that every one of this, uh, every one of you on the call should be in a drug trial, but every one of your doctors who care for you or family members should think about it and think about whether it's appropriate for. Uh, for you to be in them. And it, it, it's really going to be the way forward for, towards treatments and cures. So this is how it would work. So right now, 
you know, I should have animated this so you don't see all the dots and everything, but let's just say, let's just say that um, there's a, a drug company comes out. There's like 20 drug trials going on right now. That's not exactly the right number. So don't hold me to it, even though it's recorded. Um, drug companies are coming up with all these targets and all these medicines that they think might help treat or cure nephrotic syndrome. So what they typically do is they take a population of nephrotic syndrome patients and they give them a drug and they see who responds and who doesn't respond. But it may be that the drug that they're, they're making or developing maybe really works best against individuals with nephrotic syndrome who have a blue genetic signature. In this case, the, the, the drug companies would really like to pick um, the patients who have the blue signature or at least know who has the blue signature. So then when they sort out which patients are responding to the drug and which patients aren't responding to the drug, they can figure out if the blue signature is really the, the right patients who, who respond. At the same time, some drugs, and a lot of drug trials are stopped because maybe there's some toxicity, or there's a side effect that, um, that uh, uh, halts the study. And more and more, we're able to identify genetic variants or typos in the genome that result in patients having adverse effects. So if we knew before enrolling a patient in the study that, oh man, they have the red signature, so they're gonna have a problem with that medication, we would dump, not even enroll them in the study. And we would then do a study that's more genetically informed. So whether it was um, uh, pre, you know, pre-enrollment, we get the genetic signature, or if it's after the study is done, it may be like, let me give you an example. Like it may be the example that they give a drug to all these individuals um, oblivious to the genetic signature. And they find, you know, this drug, they'd say, oh man, this drug stinks. Like only 10% of patients who got this drug respond to the therapy. But if, if this is 100 patients and that 10% number, maybe it's like 100% of people with the blue signature responded and 0% of patients without the blue signature responded. So in that case, this is like a, uh, I was gonna say like a, like a kick butt drug, but I shouldn't say kick butt on a talk like this. So this is like a great, a great drug for the people with the blue signature. And if we didn't know the genetic profile, that drug might not have ever been developed. So genetics can be very informative. So this is one way that we could do a prospective clinical trial if we know our patient's genetic signature. So uh, let's say a drug company registers for a, a drug trial. They get a whole, the inclusion criteria is children or adults with FSGS or nephrotic syndrome, a protein spilling disease. The drug company tests for the genetic marker. And if it's positive for the marker for, that the drug is targeted against, then they go into the study and they are randomly assigned to the treatment or not, and we see what the outcome is. But if the child or adult with nephrotic syndrome is negative for the marker, they're just excluded from that trial because we have no reason to believe that this is effective. So the benefits of doing this is that we can, we can do a trial with less patients if we have the right choice of biomarker, and we could not include the patients who would do poorly if we gave them that therapy. So finally, with the last couple of slides, I, will, I just wanna talk about a couple of research updates on nephrotic syndrome genetic. I've tried to really tease it through throughout the, um, the talk or uh, weave it through, not tease it through. Um, I would say the broad ways that research is being done right now are we're doing um, cohorts and groups, our, our individual investigators in the US and around the world are collecting patients to look for uh, additional Mendelian forms of nephrotic syndrome. Investigators are working on studying APOL1 associated kidney disease using patient uh, bio samples and uh, DNA and gene expression to figure out treatments and cure for APOL1 disease. And they're also recruiting additional individuals uh, uh, focusing on those of African American uh, race or black race. And then uh, there's, there's research being done on specific clinical trials for specific drugs. And finally, there are, um, finally, there are other um, studies being done about um, uh, just, you know, collecting and creating biobanks of patients to do research. So, so I just want to talk to you about a couple of them. So one of the studies that I'm very, very involved with that is also Neptune, um, Nef, Nefcure, uh, 
supported is Neptune, the Nephrotic Syndrome Study Network. And this is a, a, a study that maybe some of you on the call are in. It's made up of about 20 or 30 sites around the US and, the, uh, uh, and Canada. And what it's doing is we're recruiting patients at the time of their first biopsy for suspected minimal change, membranous or FSGS. But in, the, in our newest phase of the study, we're also recruiting children who aren't needing a biopsy and adults who aren't needing a biopsy. We're getting all ages and ancestries, and we're following these patients longitudinally. And this is myself and Matthias Kretzer, who's one of the, the founders of Neptune. There's more information on this study here. And in Neptune, we're integrating genetic data, clinical data, social data, um, uh, zip code data, medication data. We're trying to put all of this together to not only discover new genetic signatures for disease, but once we know a genetic signature like a Mendelian disease or APOE1, we can fold in all this extra data to make additional discoveries. Neptune, other similar cohorts like this in the United States include the CureGN study, um, which also is recruiting patients with nephrotic syndrome. The C-Kids study is being done in the United States and they have a proportion of children with nephrotic syndromes as well. So this is, this is an observational cohort study and in the newest version of the Neptune study, there's now Neptune Match, where we are looking to match patients to Neptune with the best clinical trials for them to be involved in by linking them together. So again, if, there, if you want more information about that, neptunestudy.org. I wanna give you guys two, two sneak peeks on what's going on with myself here at Boston Children's and Harvard, uh, where I just recently moved after being at the University of Michigan for eight years. So, um, four researchers in nephrotic syndrome, Freedom Hildebrandt, Martin Pollack at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, Beth Israel, myself and Simone Sonikerke, an uh, adult nephrologist at Columbia University. We recently banded together with a mission to combine all the patients that we have thus far, which is around 10,000 patients with FSGS and uh, minimal change disease, to try to discover uh, new form to do these four projects, which is really just getting after ma mapping mechanisms and medicines for nephrotic syndrome. So together, we're gonna to bring together these patients and we're gonna discover new Mendelian forms of nephrotic syndrome. We're gonna study more complex genetic forms of nephrotic syndrome like APOL1 and the HLA. We're going to, once we find these genetic signatures, we're going to then bring them into mice and fish and flies and cells. And we're gonna to try to figure out the basics of why these genetic changes are causing disease. So we're gonna figure out mechanisms with experiments. We're gonna try some medicines in, in animal models to see if that helps the disease. And finally, we're gonna to try to turn this genetic data into clinically relevant information. So we're gonna to try to figure out links between genetic changes and outcomes. We're also gonna share all this data publicly online so that not only yourselves, but researchers around the world can take advantage of these discoveries. I think a thing to mention here is that this research is really empowered by the willingness and the involvement of patients and families like you guys on the call who are uh, happily enrolling and will willingly enrolling in um, uh, research studies that take you know, time and energy, sometimes require saliva sample, sometimes a blood sample or more. And, but it's really empowering us to work on the goals of the project that we're doing here. We'd never be able to do it without all of you. And then finally, um, I just want to briefly talk about a biobank that I'm generating here at Boston Children's that I'm leading. It's called Big Kids, or the Biobank to Investigate the Genomics of Kidney Disorders. One of the main reasons I made the move from Michigan to Harvard and Boston Children's was to establish this. So what Big Kids is doing is what I'm doing is establishing a genomics biobank for nephrotic syndrome. And I'm calling it dexterous and durable and useful. So what I mean by that is we're trying to collect a lot of different things. We're trying to collect it in a way that is long lasting and in a way that this bank comes from deposits and withdrawals from investigators and families in the US and around the world. Um, we, our goal is, like I said, cl collaborate with clinicians and scientists and patients and families at children's across the US and around the world. And we are setting up big kids. So within the next six months to a year, we'll be able to recruit any patient from uh, uh, other hospitals and other clinics th through uh, patients, physicians, but we're also, uh, we'll have ways that uh, families can directly contact us who are interested in learning more about this. I think that they're wonderful, uh, they're wonderful nephrologists in this country, and then they're wonderful uh, nephrology divisions and universities doing great research, and they have research infrastructure 
uh, very well developed, but I also think that there's a certain proportion of patients with nephrotic syndrome in the US and around the world who might not be linked into people who are doing this. So if they can be linked into big kids, that may be a way for people who are interested in participating in research to participate as well. So you can stay tuned for that. And again, the goals here are to do, discover, to do the mapping, discover new genetic contributors to nephrotic syndrome. And I'm convinced and I know that if we discover the genetic contributors, we can identify the molecular pathways and we can understand the mechanisms. If we can understand the mechanisms, then we can define the medicines or discover medicines. And this is not gonna be done just by me. This is a whole team and a whole world coming together, people from pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, adult nephrologists, pediatric nephrologists, cell biologists, geneticists, genetic counselors, clinicians, parents and families. This is a team, team approach, I'm an extroverted individual. And I thought I was gonna spend my career as a general pediatrician, seeing patients and families every day eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. I now spend 95% of my time not seeing patients and families because I'm convinced that the work that um, I'm a part of uh, here and globally, although I'm not getting that immediate, um, immediate benefit and uh, hit of doing clinical care, I think that this is the best long-term way of, of really coming up with treatments and cures for nephrotic syndrome. And by doing it as a team and with the involvement and engagement of uh, the folks uh, in biotech and academia and patients and families like you on the call and with patient support groups and places like Nefcure and Kristen, this allows me to, to do the things that I love doing with a really serious goal in mind. So with that, I just want to conclude by thanking you all for the, for, uh, the time today. This is my lab, the kidney omics lab, samsonlab.org. This is our contact information. This is Alex and Chris and Siung and Dong Wan and Michelle and, and Anna. And we're adding people all the time and my collaborators at Boston, uh, University of Michigan around the world and my funding sources, including Nefcure Kitty International. And with that, um, I will conclude. I thank you again for your time and I'd be totally happy to uh, uh, engage in some questions and back and forth with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have uh, some questions submitted, so I'm just going to kind of go from the top if that's okay with you. Um, this is sure. this is interesting. Uh, there is, you know, quite a bit of chatter in some of the um, social media support groups for adults uh, around nephrotic syndrome and FSGS, that sort of thing. So this question is: Can an amniocentesis identify a nephrotic syndrome? So um, if any time we have the ability to collect DNA, we can do genetic testing for Mendelian forms of nephrotic syndrome or the APOL1 allele. So if amniocentesis is done and just collects amniotic fluid, that won't allow us to test for nephrotic syndrome. But if we get genetic material, then yes, we can make a, we can identify a genetic change that uh, which can then be evaluated for its ability to you know cause nephrotic syndrome. So there's been some you know in some families in the past where multiple family members have had a form of nephrotic syndrome with the same mutation, doing pre pre implantation diagnosis or genetic testing of a, an embryo or a fetus, with the idea that that if that genetic change was present, then it would still cause a condition is it, feasible. That's great. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Another question from Amy. She's asking, is it worthy to use genetic data from commercial or academic labs to identify patients for clinical trials? She has been told that a positive genetic result for a known FSGS gene does not necessarily mean an FSGS diagnosis. Can you clarify? Yeah, Amy, that's a really great question and it's something we think about all the time. Um, I think the real, the real bottom line, did you delete the question? It's, oh, I, I'll, I can bring it back. You can go to answer. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so, so that's okay. Um, the, the bottom line is that clinical and research genetic testing is viable and um, is useful for enrollment into clinical trials. But genetic, just like any other test, like an ultrasound that's read by a radiologist or a, a renal function panel that's just interpreted by a nephrologist, uh, uh, someone with genomic literacy has to interpret that result. So sometimes with a clinical or an academic test, a genetic change, a typo, is seen in a known nephrotic syndrome gene. But just because a typo is there doesn't mean it's enough to cause the disease. 
or sometimes you need to have two copies of the genetic change and you only have one copy. So there are some instances where a change in an FSGS gene is just a change and not a disease cause mutation. But what we need to do as a community is connect patients with the right physicians or genetic counselors, nephrologists to be able to interpret that correctly. But I'd encourage you, not, I'd encourage you to think that clinical and academic genetic testing can play a, a substantial role. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Another question from Lauren. For patients with steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome or a black patient or other patient of African descent with suspected FSGS, how important is a biopsy versus a genetic test? Would you recommend biopsy first, then genetic test, or vice versa? Yeah, so Lauren, that's a really, really good question. And I think I might recognize you from Twitter, if so, hi. Um, I think that um, this is a, uh, an active area of research and ongoing clinical discussion. I think that um, if we have, and, it, and the answer is it depends, which is a lame answer, but it really does depend. So if there's a family history of, of uh, nephrotic syndrome where there's a known Mendelian form of disease, um, then and a patient shows up again with nephrotic syndrome, oftentimes we can just do the genetic test and say, okay, you're the third person in the family with it. You have the genetic change, you have the disease, no biopsies needed. Um, what I think right now, my opinion, and um, I think this is an opinion shared by many practitioners, is that genetic tests right now still take about, you know, one to two months to return. So I think that a standard of care of seeing a patient with nephrotic syndrome Getting a genetic test within, you know, initially within the first couple of weeks, a clinical genetic test, and then doing regular treatment of care, standard of care, whether it's steroids, a biopsy, if the doctor thinks that the patient needs a biopsy, makes sense. And then by the time six or eight weeks comes around and the genetic test comes back, that can be interpreted in the context of the biopsy result and the, uh, the treatment result to help inform care. So a, a common situation with this is a patient with nephrotic syndrome shows up, they get the genetic test, they do steroids for six weeks. Um, uh, the, the patient is responsible to steroids, the genetic test comes back, they have a Mendelian form of disease, and then that informs you, will we try rituximab or something like that. With APOL1 specifically, um, not a lot of clinical testing is being done right now for APOL1 because there's no directed therapy towards APOL1. My current practice right now is you know that 70% of black patients with FSGS are going to have APOL1. So I often, and we just know it's more aggressive, so I tend to be a little bit more um, uh, uh, careful about closer monitoring of those individuals. Great. Um, another question from Lauren. With how much information we now know genetic testing can offer, and since we know that biopsies offer a description but are not giving a specific diagnosis. Yeah. How important do you think biopsies will be in the future? Yeah, I think biopsies will still play a very important role now and in the future because genetics, you know, some forms of ge genetic disease are very black and white. Like if you have the genetic change, you have the disease, but oftentimes it's not exactly 100% concordant. And furthermore, the genetic change may set off the disease, but doesn't also often tell us about the degree of inflammation, or uh, fibrosis or things that might result in differential progression of the disease. So I think the biopsy in many cases will still have a very important role and will never be completely, um, completely uh, uh, wiped out by genetic testing. Great, we have uh, another question from an someone anonymous that attended today. What are the common biomarkers used for various nephrotic syndromes? Yeah, so thank you, Anonymous. Um, that's a good question. So um, the most common biomarker for nephrotic syndrome is proteinuria. So if there's a lot of protein in the urine, and then creatinine, that's another biomarker for kidney damage. Um, you might be talking about more specific biomarkers that are about nephrotic syndrome, but there are not a lot that, um, that are available that give us an idea of a person's specific genetic or molecular cause. Some research has shown um, uh, epidermal growth factor, this urine EGF, has shown prognostic ability to talk about who will progress or not. Um, um, SUPAR is another biomarker that seems in general, not specific to nephrotic syndrome, that's indicative of, of different progression rates. 
So there are a lot of uh, TNF alpha is a biomarker, but these are all research based and not really ready for prime time clinical. Great. Stacy has a question for FSGS person who has received a kidney transplant. Is their genetic information still useful for clinical trials? Yeah, Cece, thanks for that question too. I think definitely, depending on the clinical trial, I think um, that uh, absolutely. Um, and each cl each clinical trial will have a um, have a uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. But I can certainly imagine some roles of the of the genetic background for sure. All right, Mihir ask: Is it true that FSGS below twenty years old has a two thirds chance, I guess, of a genetic basis? Uh, thanks, Mihir. The answer is no. Um, it's not true. Um, uh, uh, what I've uh, there was a, a paper a, a long time ago that said uh, two thirds of patients with nephrotic syndrome in the first year of life have a Mendelian form of the disease. Um, I think that's uh, it's probably not that much two thirds, but in some places it might be. So the when you get a prevalence estimate, it's like what percent of kids have a genetic form of the disease. It's highly influenced by. Uh, uh, their genetic, their ethnic background, the country that they're from, which is really uh, um, about uh, the parents' genetics, whether they have steroid resistance or steroid sensitivity. So, for uh, for populations where um, cousins um, procreate together, there's a much higher chance of there being a genetic form of their disease. Um, for places like in the U.S., Brazil, uh, other places in Western Europe, it, it, it's lower. So I think it, uh, yeah. So it just really depends. Great. Another anonymous question. How translatable are the results in animal models to human disease? Yeah, that's a really, that's another uh, wonderful question I'm happy to answer. So um, for certain, uh, uh, for a lot of these Mendelian forms of disease, uh, flies, mice, zebrafish are really great models. And again, it's like, um, it's like for those of us who cook, I'll just call it like, you know, if you want to make a certain dish, you know, for certain dishes, certain tools are best. Like to make lasagna, in a stir fry pan would not make sense, but if you want to make lasagna and you have a eight by and eleven ceramic, you know, uh, you know, thingamajiggy, uh, what's it called, baking pan. But that's right. So we know that for like NPHS one, NPHS two, WT one, fish, flies, mice work. For others, APOL one is a real challenge because APOL one isn't expressed in animals, so we had to make these engineered animals. So even flies. I do some work with a collaborator, Zihan, on Washington DC with flies and. Um, flies are even very helpful. That's interesting. Thank you. We are yeah. at our time limit. I want to ask you one more question since we sure. are on the topic of gen genetic testing and this is obviously a hot topic for yeah. this patient community. If a patient or a parent or caregiver um, is interested in genetic testing, how do you suggest that they go about doing this? Are there resources or places that you would suggest that they go um, or do they need to go directly to their physician? What would you suggest? Yeah, I, I think at this point in time, I think that for a lot of situations, genetic testing is no longer just in the realm of research. I think it's actually a, should be incorporated into clinical care in a number of situations. So if a patient is interested in genetic testing, I think that they should always start having a conversation with their clinician. And if, um, and if that clinician, that clinician will probably have a sense of things and if they want further information after that, they can always feel free to reach out to me um, via email or, or contact me through various organizations. But I, I would also encourage, you know, NEFCURE, you guys do a wonderful job of counseling and advising. And I think that uh, you're a wonderful resource for people to contact and you guys do a wonderful job connecting patients and families with the right physicians or the right labs. So. Absolutely. I just want to answer one more question from Dr. Shisti. So yeah, in, a gen in the genetic test positive patient, do you recommend only supportive therapy and avoid immunosuppression? So um, at this point, I still think, you know, there are some instances of patients with genetic monogenic disease or APOL1 disease, who for reasons that we don't quite understand do respond to immunosuppression. So I prefer to do standard treatment of care for the first six weeks or so of, of, of treatment uh, of a patient's experience and um, if that patient uh, uh, goes into remission and they have a genetic form of the disease, then I pay more attention to their clinical outcome. We also, there's a recent paper that just came out by the group at uh, University College London. Uh, uh, Tullis is a senior author. that looked at the overlap of, of response to immunotherapy based on genetic forms and showed that there are patients with genetic forms of the disease who do respond to tacrolimus. 
and cyclosporin. So I'd be really hesitant at this point in time to deny a patient opportunity to go into remission um, based on just genetics alone. But if a patient had a genetic form of their condition and they didn't respond to tacrolimus or FK, you know, or something else, calcineurins within a couple of weeks, I'd be more likely to say, you know, this isn't going to work. Okay. okay. So I will say, those of you that we didn't get to your questions, I have copied them. And Dr. Sampson, if you're willing, I can send them to you and I can get those answers to the patient during my follow-up now. Um, so that's one thing. I would like to thank you. Um, you know, just to, just to close up this session, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, if you are interested in Neptune or CureGN, or even the Rare Genomes Project, which is another uh, resource. Um, these are research-based. Um, or big kids, or big kids. Or big kids. Um, you can definitely reach directly out to me, khood at nefcure.org. We also have um, th these uh, projects on kidneyhealthgateway.com. We don't have big kids, but I think we need to try to get that on that website pretty soon. Um, whenever you open it up to uh, the gen, you know, bigger population, Dr. Sampson. So we, you can find resources there. Um, and then likewise, you can always find resources, patient education, um, and you'll be able to find this webinar recording at nefcure.org. So feel free to find us there. We appreciate all of you being here and uh, yeah. look for a follow-up email from me later this week. Thanks, Dr. Sampson, so much. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everyone, for joining. It's, it's such a pleasure to be able to do this. Now, back to the research. That's right. That's right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right, thank you. Bye-bye.